Hello there, I'm editing Brian. You normally talk to filming Brian and he likes to go on and on and on about things, but I try to do the opposite. Right now, I have been trying to cut 538 gigabytes of footage about ice crystals down into bite-sized things that I can put out on YouTube. Of course, without throwing too much of the interesting stuff away. So if you got to the end of my last video about the ice crystal growth apparatus and thought, man, we didn't get to see all the time lapses, or why did it take so many tries to get right? Or maybe, why did you never get it right? This video is for you. So that is how you grow a big, faceted, hexagonal water ice crystal. But you may be wondering, why did I name the vacuum chamber? And why did we need to go through that weird seed crystal process at the start? Well, you got to see the version that worked right off the bat. I did not. If you leave the Peltier cooler out in open air, you get dendritic growth. You can see that this basically looks like frost forming on the Peltier. Little fine filaments of ice grow out in different directions and then they fall over and you know, completely mess up the crystal structure by, by literally breaking and bending all the time. We need the growth to be slow and free of holes. So in the first ice video I talked about dendritic freezing of pure liquid water. And I said that you could get branches of ice surrounded by warm water that didn't freeze right away, but it would eventually freeze. In air, however, once you freeze all the water out, you can get dry air between ice dendrites. Basically, you've used up all of the water vapor in the air, and then to fill this gap in the solid, new molecules of water vapor need to barge their way through all this nitrogen that's blocking their way, and that just doesn't happen. So you're left with these tiny filament structures that have no way to connect to one another. This is one factor that I think limits the size of regular snowflakes, because most snowflakes are in fact not manually grown in vacuum chambers in the clouds. Once you get rid of the air, and given that you have the temperature of the substrate controlled within a specific range, you generally don't get dendritic growth. But you can get polycrystalline growth, and that's another thing that we don't want. Without starting with a single crystal seed, we get a whole bunch of different nuclei forming all over the surface of the Peltier. All of them are hexagonal and faceted, but they all point in different directions, and there's no real order to the whole thing. If you let this keep growing and you let them stick together, then you'll eventually end up with this sort of hemispherical lump that's kind of faceted randomly all over. It's a faceted ice crystal, but it's more like a bunch of individual ice crystals, and it's not nearly as cool as having one chunk with a bunch of lined up hexagons. However, I did film a bunch of these because it was really easy to reset and it looked pretty cool. The ice crystal that I'm about to remove from the freezer here is going to be the last one. Uh, not, not because I expect it to be perfect. I don't think that it's going to be, you know, one single big hexagonal prism with centimeter scale facets, but because I've been at this for literally more than six months now and I need to be done. I need to communicate to you all the things that I have learned about ice crystals and what makes this such a challenge. Some of my earliest crystal growth runs actually showed the best hexagonal faceting. They were dome-shaped crystals with extremely flat tops and hexagonal edges, making terraces all the way down the chunk of ice. It looks kinda like someone had tried to make a dome shape in a hexagonal Minecraft mod. Does that actually exist, hexagonal Minecraft? It sounds kinda cool. Anyway. I originally attributed this shape to the ever-raging war between thermodynamics and kinetics. Thermodynamics wanted hard, faceted crystalline edges, but kinetics would only let the water molecules move so far across the surface before they froze, limiting the size of the facets. Where molecules of water stick to a vaguely, you know, hemispherical shape, but they can move around a short distance to form facets. If it can move really far, then it can form big, long, flat surfaces. All of that reasoning still may be true, but I was wrong about one really crucial parameter. These crystals weren't actually grown exclusively by deposition. Sometimes they were grown by freezing, because the variable temperature in the freezer would occasionally allow the crystal to melt and refreeze. 
I only actually figured this out about a month ago when I started trying to take a time lapse of this crystal growth process and I realized what was happening. In the world of material science research, we would refer to this as an in situ characterization technique. We're actively watching a process like crystallization or a phase transformation or something like that. We're watching the process while it's occurring. With a lot more data here, actually the ability to watch these crystals growing, it's very clear that the ice originally grows by deposition and then melts and then refreezes and then continues growing by deposition. And this remelting process happens a number of times over the few days that this particular crystal took to grow. It ensures that the crystal stays dense because any little dendritic -y parts get reabsorbed as liquid and all the gaps get filled. However, the overall dome shape of the crystal was actually largely based on the surface tension of water. This is literally like one big droplet of water very slowly being frozen from the inside out. And the really cool thing is how readily it facets once it's frozen. When you have ice that's just barely below the freezing point, the molecules don't stick together very well, and the faceting gets really extreme. Upon seeing this melting, though, I tried to stop it. I ended up reading a lot about freezer defrost cycles, and I attempted to stop the defrost cycle on this freezer by wedging a screwdriver into the, the timer, but to no avail. The temperature in the freezer still fluctuated heavily. Remember that the Peltier cooler only keeps one surface a bit colder than the other. It doesn't control any absolute temperature in the system. The only way I was able to stop the occasional melting was by suspending the Peltier's heatsink higher in the chamber so that it wasn't touching the metal and adding a lot more water. So I was basically encasing the bottom of the Peltier in ice before I started the experiment. That meant that I was sublimating ice into vapor and depositing that water vapor back into ice at a different location. So the growth rate was dependent on the sublimation rate of ice at something like minus 20 C, so it was really slow. The fact that all of this was happening so cold at the freezer's standard temperature of like minus 15 to minus 20 seemed like it could be really good based on phase diagrams that I'd been able to find in the literature. But this phase diagram is for deposition of water from wet air, not deposition of low pressure water vapor in a vacuum chamber. And it's also really only discussing snowflake sized crystals where I was looking for centimeter scale crystals, which I think actually requires a higher temperature because of the kinetics involved and that you have to travel, like individual molecules need to be able to travel long distances to form large facets. Unfortunately, my freezer temperature was not very consistent. You can actually see here that every time that it warms up and a bunch of the ice that accumulated near the camera sublimates away, the crystal grows real fast for a few minutes. The variable temperature of the freezer was causing surges in the growth because it was sublimating away all the ice that had deposited on the window and all of that new water vapor was immediately sticking to the growing crystal. This sort of surging growth rate made for very inconsistent shapes. All of that said, I was actually able to get a growth from this technique that looked very nearly hexagonal on the outside. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch because it's not actually a dense structure, but I'm willing to take it as a win. I still think that the structures here are really, really beautiful. So now it is time to see what the last crystal looks like. I pulled the, uh, the time-lapse camera off this like a week ago because I intended to film this bit last weekend, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Look at all the ice that, uh, you know, didn't work. Looks like snow, hexagonal snow though, look at that. That's a hexagon right there. Here we go. Oh yeah, of course this is all frozen in. Let's just unhook these. <laughs> Even the ice growing on the inside of this is cool looking. So, oh wow, look at that. That actually has quite some faceting on it, if you hit the light just right. 
All of the top surface is seaplane. Man, I wish I'd let the camera go for another week. Check that out. The tops are so flat. Like the, the seaplane fastening is really hard. Cool. Well, it's not one big crystal, but it is a bunch of little hexagons and they have some absolutely gorgeous seaplane faceting. I'm happy with that. So what would it take to get really large centimeter scale ice crystals growing nicely? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I think that what you want is a really slow growth rate combined with a very high growth temperature. So you wanna be just below the freezing point. You wanna hold it at like minus three Celsius and you want so little vapor in the atmosphere around your growing piece of ice that it deposits really, really slowly. If I had another six months to burn, uh, I would buy a new freezer. I, I already had to buy a new freezer for this project because I broke one, but I would buy another freezer that was disposable and take apart the control circuit and try to tighten the control loop so that I could get it to stay within, I don't know, minus two Celsius to minus four Celsius, as opposed to this one that fluctuates between like two and minus 20 and idles at like minus 18. The other issue comes with actually filming this. So I have a whole bunch of resistors spread out on the top of the vacuum chamber so that they can basically de-ice that window. But I think that those throw a wrench into the works in terms of temperature control, because that means that that window is hotter than anything else in the chamber. And you've got extra temperature gradients and difficult things. So if I was to keep making changes to this, I would get a really deep vacuum chamber and I would film it from a ways away. And so that the heated window was very far from the stuff that I want to remain cold at a constant temperature. So am I 100% sure that that would work? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not even 10% sure that that would work. There are so many things that I tried with this project that I expected were going to work and then failed miserably. Would I be thrilled to answer emails about it if you were to try and I didn't have to? Yes. I certainly enjoyed working on this project and learned so much more than I ever wanted to about growing ice crystals from vapor. Thanks for watching. Oop. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for watching and thanks for subscribing. This is part of uh, making a new one of these.